If you look at the history of how companies have grown over the last century, the primary driver has been to create sustained shareholder returns in a world with predictable rules to the game. That world no longer exists. Today, social tension, economic nationalism, and technological revolutions are reshaping business. And the bar that once defined top performance has not only risen, but it has transformed. It's becoming clear that being great is no longer good enough. To lead in this new reality, you'll need a new playbook of strategies that delivers value not only for your shareholders, but to all stakeholders. To thrive, you'll need to go beyond great. Welcome everyone to The Economist's virtual event, The Business Leader's Playbook, rewriting the old news to build a high performing business. This is sponsored by BCG. So it really is hard to exaggerate the challenges that businesses have faced um, in 2020. Companies have had to cope with COVID-19, US-China tensions, social protest, very divisive US election um, just passed and um, a vast acceleration in digital adoption. I've just been writing about Disney, for instance, um, a, 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 ven a venerable entertainment company where the, the longtime boss, Bob Iger, thought he was sailing off um, to, to hand over to his successor at a moment of glory um, for the company. Uh, then now the, the theme parks are shut, the cruise liners are docked, the movie theatres are shut. Um, and the only bright spot for the company is, is, the, is its streaming service, Disney+. Plus. And what's more, when they tried to lay off 28,000 people to try and cope with all of this, sort of losses for um, the first time in history for a long time, they get attacked by Senator um, Elizabeth Warren. So that's really, that, that's one example at the top of my mind. One of the best descriptions I've heard of what it's like um, at the moment for the business world comes from the CEO of Whirlpool. Um, he calls these times torn times. Um, and I think that's a, a, a perfect description. And I don't think it's going to calm down um, anytime soon. And the good news is that these sorts of environments um, definitely can provide a lot of opportunity. It sounds, it sound, sounds like a cliche, but it, but it really is true. Um, if you're a company that gets it right, in terms of coming up with innovation um, and changing your competitive positioning. But there's no question that the old rule book for chief executives is getting, um, if you will, torn up in these torn times. And the question we're looking at today in this panel is, is really what the new rule book is. What should CEOs be prioritizing in order to cope with all these kind of multiple shocks um, to the corporate system? Um, with me to discuss this, I have um, Nicolaus Lang, who is the global leader of BCG's global advantage practice. Um, Nicolaus has worked for many years with companies on their globalization strategies, so he must be pretty interested to deal with the kind of economic nationalism um, and supply chain shocks that we're seeing. Poppy Gustafsson, um, chief executive of Dark Trace a UK-based, UK and um, San Francisco headquartered supplier of AI-based cybersecurity solutions to companies. And Maria Espinel, Chief Executive of BSA, which stands for Business Software Alliance. Um, if, if you're still, um, you, you haven't entirely gone for the acronym, Victoria. This is an, an enterprise software trade group based in um, Washington, DC. Um, BSA is representing the software makers that we're all relying on during this time of pandemic. Um, the, before we just kick off, I'd like to thank BCG in particular for sponsoring the discussion. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, and just a little reminder that in a, in a, a Zoom world, and this, this definitely applies to me as well as to you, our panelists, please remember to keep your, um, keep your answers and interventions kind of fairly pithy and structured um, and brief, because we don't have the um, advantage of, of uh, body language and atmosphere that we do in the real world. Um, so I guess the, the first question that I'd like to pose to each of you will have um, an, a, a sort of various questions which, I'll, um, which you'll all um, get to answer. 
The first word, the first one is um, is this sort of rather familiar idea of what keeps bosses awake at night. And you know, maybe in the past it would be thing, you know, sort of classic business issues like you know keeping shareholders happy, getting the best talent to join your company, future regulatory directions. I don't. I think those those are not the issues causing um, insomnia um, in the C-suite at the moment. So the first question is, um, and and perhaps this goes to Nicolaus, what do you think are the the new um, issues and dilemmas? Um, and threats keeping CEOs awake at night right now in 2020? Well, that's a big question to start with, uh, but I'll do my best to, to give a focused and structured answer to that. Uh, and I'd like to build maybe on uh, a recent work we have done also at BCG uh, uh, around uh, a book uh, called Beyond Great, where we have been looking at uh, more than 50 CEOs and their companies uh, and what is actually for them uh, the challenges. And the interesting thing is that it boils down to three major forces that companies are facing today. Uh, that is number one, social tension. That is number two, economic nationalism. And that's number three, digital transformation. Um, I think coming to social tension, uh, we tend to see this as a 2020 issue, but it has been there much earlier. Uh, you know, obviously we have had this year the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, but we have had the, the Gilets Jaunes in France. We have had the social unrest in Chile in the previous years. So there has been a continuous, I would say, increase of social tension and inequality, which is a big challenge for many companies and, and to see how they can really thrive in that environment. That's the first point. The second point is economic nationalism. Again, um, this is something where uh, going back to 1944, the Bretton Woods Conference has laid the foundation for a free trade world. And I think we've had the benefit of the free trade world for about 70 years. But I would say specifically in the last five years, we have had a massive increase of econo economic nationalism. I don't know if you're aware, but 80% of the world GDP has been subject to new trade rules or is being renegotiated for new trade rules. So four out of five trade dollars have suddenly new tariffs, new export restrictions, new import restrictions, and so on. Uh, so again, I think that's a big challenge. And the third topic is digital transformation, where again, obviously we've been talking a lot about this, but uh, I think combined with COVID, we have seen such a pivoting, even of the most traditional businesses towards digital, that these are, I would say, the three trends that represent chal the challenges for the CEO uh, in this 21st century. And um, Nicolaus, which, which is the scariest for bosses? I mean, digital transformation presumably is, is more of an opportunity and it's something that they've been thinking about for, for several years. I mean, is, yeah. is, there, is, is it just incredibly difficult to, um, for bosses, to, for companies to insert themselves into the arena of inequality or social tension, for instance? Because here, I mean, you're really, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty of it, you're talking about how much are you paying people? You know, what are the what are the pay gaps? You know, this is quite difficult territory, right? As my Disney example, I think, um, evoked. Yes. yes. So, so I think there are two things to, 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 to you said, what is the scariest? I think uh, if we if you define scariest in terms of really novel, and in terms of relatively unprepared, I would be more inclined to say it's actually economic nationalism. Because you have had generation of bosses, of CEOs, that were thinking that the world is flat, that you can put a big low-cost factory in China and serve the world out of a low-cost factory in China or Bangladesh or somewhere else. And suddenly people say, wow, I have COVID, I have a breakdown of supply chain. I have suddenly new tariffs. And I'm talking to CEOs who say, we just don't have the skill set to handle this because in the past, tariffs were not much of an issue. Supply chains were always working. 
So I think in terms of scarier, in t uh, I would rather be on the air side of this economic nationalism. And by the way, not only for hardware, but also for software, I'm sure we'll see a lot about that coming up. But if I look at the whole US-China tech decoupling and frictions we see, uh, this is not just a problem for traded goods like cars or white goods or textiles. This is something that applies to many, many areas, including data and services. Thank you. Um, Victoria, I think that provides a natural seg into asking you the same question. Um, I'm sure that you speak regularly to your members um, who are confronting these sorts of issues. But, but just very, you know, to start from first principles, how do you think the sort of the, the nightmare sub, the nightmare list for bosses has changed um, this year versus, you know, maybe the the, you know, let's let's say pre 2016. You know, so pre 2016, what were bosses worried and scared about, and 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 then fast forward to now, if you would. Hmm. 2016 is an interesting number to date to pick. Um, so so uh, Nicholas, you said so much that I want to um, pick up on, and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss on this. You know, particularly as a former trade negotiator for the United States government at an earlier point in my career. Um, the economic nationalism is, is something that I'm very attuned to. But you know, in terms of in terms of the company, you know, myself and the companies, the software companies I represent, I think that the two things that I would focus on most recently that have been have been keeping them up. I mean, one is sort of the obvious: is the health and safety of our global teams is something that CEOs care about at any times. But there's a, an urgency to it. Um, right now because of the pandemic that is different. And so I know that is that is very much on the minds of, of all CEOs. Um, but the second thing I would say that, that has really um, is really fascinating is the, the depth of conversation on access and equality issues. And there are three things I would sort of note underneath that. You know, part is access to economic opportunity. I hope we have a chance to talk more about that. I think there's a lot that can be done to um, increase access to economic opportunity. And I think there's uh, a deep commitment to that. The second, you know, specifically for software and tech, I think is thinking about how technology can be used to improve access and how, how, how to make sure it's not used to exacerbate problems. So for example, how to make sure, you know, artificial intelligence is not being used in a way that's discriminatory, but then going beyond that and thinking about are there ways that software and tech can be used to actually broaden inclusion and the third thing I would say, you know, again, and Nichols alluded to this, is the, the conversation about racial justice um, has, you know, in America, the UK, countries around the world, this is an issue that has really come to the forefront. I think there's a lot of opportunity in that to sort of seize this and, and really make some concrete progress. And I know um, in the C-suite of the companies I represent, looking at hiring practices, looking at supply chain practices, looking at really concrete ways to make a positive impact is an enormous focus right now. Um, so th those are the things that I would highlight. Thank you. And, and sort of to match Nikolaus's point about CEOs worrying that they, you know, the, the real sort of core fear, we don't have the skill set to deal with you know, a US-China um, tech split or, you know, other kinds of economic nationalism. So that's a very concrete, we don't have the people who know how to deal with that. How, which among these areas, which are obviously, um, you know, subjects that CEOs are thinking about, where do you think is the real crunch point of, oh my God, can, can we deal with this? From a business strategy point of view, I mean, I think the health and safety of our employees obviously enormously important. Um, I think access and equality is more of an opportunity if we take that opportunity. I, I think the economic nationalism points that Nicholas raised are of deep concern and have been, frankly, even before COVID. I mean, this has been a, a trend for a few years. Um, and I think that, you know, and it's not just a US-China issue. Um, you know, I think across, um, across Europe, across Latin America, there's been troubling trends in terms of nationalism and populism generally. Um, but I think there's been an, a, a, a move towards looking inward. And I think in some ways COVID has accelerated that. I think there's been a number of other factors at play as well. And that 
you know, for global multinational companies, that is a significant risk, not just a risk in terms of workforce and supply chain, but also that, but also just in terms of, you know, market access and your ability to be able to compete in markets um, on fair and open terms. Great. Um, Poppy, would you talk about how you think, I mean, you're a CEO um, here um, in this group. Um, so tell me what was what was your, on your keeping awake list um, a few years ago? Uh, what's on it now? How has that changed? I think if, and to be honest, many of the conversations that I'm having with CEOs uh, in our client base today is uh, is that digital transformation piece. Their whole business has shifted to online in a matter of days. And these are people that aren't necessarily technologists. They're used to having and running their business in a particular way. And overnight, they've had to change the way that they're running their businesses. And most of them are genuinely fearful that they're going to sit down at the kitchen table on a Monday morning, open up their laptop, and their business won't be there. It won't be accessible to them because suddenly the resilience of the technology base of which their entire business operates is suddenly dependent on something that is out of their perceived control. The operations of factories, their employee base, being able to communicate with each other, that is suddenly very, very dependent on a technology platform that we weren't necessarily dependent on historically. So there's a real understanding now that they're beholden to that sort of digital infrastructure in the way that they had a plan B for before that now doesn't necessarily exist accelerating that with the idea about this, the growing geopolitical influence and sort of nation states using sort of the Western's dependence on that digital infrastructure to, to leverage their own influence, for example, sort of nation states attacks. And we hear a lot about that and about uh, corporate espionage that happens conversations that were happening in boardrooms that might have been conversations between people are now happening over digital. And there's a real sense of how do they make sure that that those communications are protected and understood and that their business can continue to operate. But lastly, also, how do they lead? How do they lead this digital business? A lot of CEOs are personalities that are used to standing up in front of people and motivating and embedding culture. How can mm. that be done? How can you retain culture? How can you bring your employees on board and make them part of your business in a world where you can't sit in a room in front of them and, and shake their hands and welcome them into the business? So for a lot of the conversations that I'm having with some CEOs today is just that real tactical, how do you keep the business running when all the ways that you used to know how to run a business has been completely torn up. And just to follow up on that, I, I, I loved your example of, the, of, of, of the, the leader kind of worrying about whether the business is going to be there when they open up their laptop. And have there been, I and mean, of course, we, we, you know, there's, there's always the continued um, cases of um, security breaches and, and this sort of thing, but have there been cases that you know of, I mean, obviously not naming any names, but where you have had sort of real um, kind of difficulties in you know, just basic business continuity because, because of everything being remote. Absolutely. And like, first of all, mm. I take my hat off to the world for the fact that it can innovate its way out of this problem. And this digital transformation has really allowed it. But the bad news is, is that the, the bad guys are innovators too, and they're just constantly looking for that weak link in any chain that they can exploit. And we've seen so the number of attacks that are happening on sort of digital collaboration tools, virtual conferencing, things like that, that's increased 400 percent, obviously, due to the fact that that is now something that businesses are dependent on. But we're also seeing a lot of these spear phishing emails and the like. This is where people sort of impersonate other people trying to get them to click on a link or something within a malicious email. And that has increased a phenomenal amount by taking advantage of the pandemic situation. So, for example, we've seen an example of an email where someone, an external, was masquerading as a member of the HR team talking about a how people can access the furlough scheme. And that was sent around to the employees of an organization. Of course, that was an email, was a fake, and it was just trying to encourage people to click on that malicious link. So we've seen a huge uptake in leveraging the confusion and the interest in the pandemic to, for sort of nefarious reasons. 
What we've also seen, which is quite interesting, I found, is that we recently saw uh, someone hacking a the biometric biometric access server within an empty office. So your sort of fingerprint type scanner controls that you have on your physical office. And in the days when suddenly everyone is no longer in the office, there's no sort of human beings around to say, hey, what's that person up to? We are seeing breaches on those sort of security systems that are left in those sort of physical offices that are no longer sort of occupied and monitored in the way that they once were. Fantastic. Thank you. I'd like to drill down a little bit into your theme of economic nationalism, Nicolaus, because as as you said, um, this is the one which is perhaps sort of most novel and hardest for CEOs to deal with. Um, and in your book, um, Going Beyond Great, um, which looks at these three forces, social tension, um, technological change um, and rising economic nationalism. You've, you've got a number of strategies um, for firms to deal with all of these. And I guess you are um, suggesting um, some particular strategies on economic nationalism. So um, you're recommending companies growing selectively and perhaps not in every market around the world. I mean, I guess that sort of suggests that a sort of end to the global company or, a, you know, the company aiming to, to be as global as possible. I, I find that really fascinating. Um, you're also recommending, um, you know, building a global data architecture um, and investing in high tech, resilient facilities. So, the, I mean, those those seem particular strategies to deal with this kind of economic nationalism. And what if you just home in on that one area, what should the CEO's playbook be um, with regard to this particular trend? Yeah, I think with regard to this particular trend, with regard to uh, uh, geopolitics, I think there are there are two or three f elements of focus we should emphasize. I think first, as you described, we see more and more companies having a very, I would say, asset light uh, and uh, differentiated approach to to globalization. Uh, what we mean is, I think uh, in the past you had companies which thought that they need factories and sales offices in 50, 100, 150 countries of this world. Um, and what we see much more now is that uh, companies are thinking very hard where to go and where not to go and how to go there. Uh, the example, for example, of this um, uh, Chinese mobile phone operator Xiaomi, uh, who became one of the leading players in India with only, I would say, a set of very few uh, distribution partners, uh, no factory on the ground, is just an example for that. Um, I think the second element which plays an important role is that in this geopolitical environment, you also need to have a much clearer view of your supply chain. You know, when COVID hit, uh, people didn't realize that 50% of the steering wheels, steering wheels for cars that are being built into U.S. cars are coming from Wuhan. Yeah. So uh, if you have the lockdown of Wuhan, one out of two cars being built in U.S. didn't have a steering wheel to be completed and finishing a car without steering wheel is a challenge. So um, so I think having a clarity about where is your supply chain really uh, coming from and what can you do to build resilience in this supply chain is something which plays also, I think, a huge role. Um, and the third topic, which I think is, uh, and then I'm closing here, is that companies need to think much more in ecosystems as, I would say, flexible networks of collaboration instead of, uh, you know, I buy a Indian company, I buy a Chinese company, I build up a joint venture with a partner. I think uh, building redundancies and resilience through ecosystems, through networks, where you might be playing with two or three partners instead of one uh, is very important. So in, in, in a nutshell, I would say is go it in a differentiated asset light way, uh, make sure you have a full understanding of your supply chain and move away from bilateral relationships to multilateral ecosystems. 
Great, thank you. Um, Victoria, I'd love to solicit your views on, on the challenges of economic nationalism and how CEOs can prepare for, 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 the, for this kind of new world. And I mean, presumably, um, the, the new US administration may, may turn down the temperature somewhat um, on, on some of those um, relationships, but love to know your view. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, I'm happy to talk about sort of, you know, what I think the the incoming U.S. administration will mean for tech generally, um, or it's going to drill down on this question of economic nationalism. Um, Let, let's go on nas economic nationalism. So I think I think it's uh, yeah. So, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about um, and that we spend a, a lot of time thinking about at BSA is is the movement of data. Right. So I think, you know, data has been central to um, companies, business strategy plans for many years. I think the digitalization that Poppy was talking about under COVID has only accelerated the need for companies to be able to make sure that the data that they have can move around the world so they can make sure their employees are being paid, for example. And I think one of the, the real threats of the economic nationalism is those restrictions on data. As we see governments moving more towards data residency requirements or data localization requirements, trying to keep data within borders, that that is a real concern. That is one of the types of economic nationalism that we are seeing around the world. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of there, there are various business strategies that companies can try to employ them, but not all of them are going to be, in my view, suboptimal. All of them are going to be trying to make accommodations to unfortunate government policies on data localization. So what we spend a lot of our time doing is working with governments around the world, either governments that believe in kind of forward looking policies on data moving around the world, working with them. Um, to encourage that, and then working with governments who are who are taking or considering taking a different view, one that is more restrictive on letting data move around the world, um, and encouraging them not to adopt those policies. But I think that is a um, I think there are a number of reasons why governments start moving towards data localization. But I think the economic nationalism that Nicholas talked about is a is a big underpinning of why we've been seeing that trend around the world. And in, in terms of it, and uh, the last thing I'll say is it's not just an issue in terms of companies business strategy. It clearly is. I mean, the cost and the inefficiency and in some cases, the just inability to operate that comes from data localization is a real concern. It's also really bad for consumers in the market because ultimately what it does is cut off their access to technology or cut off their access to the best technology or cut off their access to their technology of choice. So it, it has negative economic ramifications. I think both on the business side, but also on the consumer side. Thank you. And so just just to sum up, um, so Nicolaus, your view is that the, the sort of social tension inequality um, type uh, problems, those are something that, that that's something that companies are, are already relatively used to dealing with, perhaps over the last um, decade or so. Um, and similarly, digital transformation. But just to just to emphasise, your view is that economic nationalism is is just something that's really difficult to cope with, and that CEOs are still coming up with what they should do. Well, let, let, let's not make it totally black and white. Huh? I think uh, uh, economic nationalism is uh, in its novelty and in its impact. I think, uh, uh, yes, newer uh, than the two other trends we see. Yeah, And maybe one point I just wanted to say, Victoria, you just mentioned it before. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, would be a complete dream to think that the incoming administration will change a lot in the current situation we have in global trade. Yeah, And also when you look at the EU with the new carbon tax coming up, we see also a certain aspect of geopolitical uh, movements going forward. So I personally believe that economic nationalism is the is the is the newest 
of those three trends. But again, I think digital transformation is a phenomenal challenge for many companies going forward. And I think Poppy just mentioned it very well. Uh, the number of companies that were selling, I don't know, that's tr used to sell. Uh, one of my favorite examples is a Chinese company that used to sell furniture in bricks and mortar stores and suddenly went online in five days yeah, and sold 35,000 items of furniture online. Um, so the digital transformation is phenomenal. And I think also the social tension uh, is enormous. And I think we have some companies that are really, I think, engaging a lot in total societal impact, but there are others that I think need to continue in that direction. So uh, I'm, I'm, I just want to say those three trends are equally important. Economic nationalism is a bit more novel. Great. Well, the, I definitely want to come back to the the, the total societal impact and, and the subject of shareholder returns um, versus um, broader society, because it's, it's definitely a pet topic of mine, and I really want to know your views. But first of all, a, a slightly more generic question, um, which nevertheless is, I think, is of great interest. Simply with your insight, um, Poppy, let's start with you um, and you know, drawing on your conversation. Conversations with Dark Traces clients um, and your own and your own um, insights as well. Of course, what would be your biggest business prediction for the post-COVID world? Um, we've had that good um, vaccine news recently. So, looking beyond the pandemic, what in what stays, what doesn't? How much is it? How much is, is it just a, a question of returning to normality versus? You know, which of what new behaviors stick, stick around? Uh, I, I think I think there's a lot of behaviors that all of our businesses are exhibiting today. And that acceleration of digital transformation is not something that people and businesses are going to step back from. These changes are here to stay. Um, but I think there's some other sort of more nefarious activities that we have seen in recent years, which I think will accelerate. So, for example, there's a lot of sort of disinformation that's being used around things like such as influencing political outcomes. You mentioned the vaccine and all the disinformation that is occurring around vaccinations. And there's a lot of coverage about that. One of my worries is that we will start to see those campaigns of disinformation as a means to influence and manipulate moving over into sort of the commercial and corporate world where you're seeing businesses subject to disinformation campaigns and misinformation to sort of tarnish brands. And that is something that I worry will be one of the one of the things that we've been seeing recently that will accelerate and move more into the sort of business world as we move out the other side of um, the pandemic. Are there cases of that or, or is this really just it, it sort of stands to reason that if it's as prevalent in one sphere then it's going to leak over into the corporate world or are, are there actual cases? This is fascinating. <laughs> Not that we've seen so far, but it's something that you start to see those sort of creeping changes. So in terms of sort of the cybersecurity space, uh, you used to see a lot of activity around sort of political activism. And that was tend to be sort of lobbied towards sort of government and politics. And now we've seen a big shift, given everything that's happening around uh, coronavirus into malicious activity towards academic institutions and those that are researching the sort of vaccinations. And you start to see the misinformation campaigns first launched against government and then it's moving to that vaccines world. I just there's a sense that it's only a matter of time before that starts transcending into sort of the business and the corporate world. And that's one of the things that we've been chatting to our clients about and their views. And it's not something we've necessarily seen today, but I suspect and I fear that it won't be very long before we start seeing those early signs of that. Hmm. Thank you. Victoria, your business predictions post COVID, please. Um, well, before that, actually, I want to comment on what Poppy said, because I think this issue of deep fakes is a really important one. And Poppy, I'd love to continue this conversation even offline. But, you know, just quickly, I think there's a big education part. of it. I think I think people need to understand kind of what the possibilities that are out there. So they aren't um, so they're more educated consumers of information. I think we need to be doing more to de detect and identify what is out there. Obviously, tech and software is a big part to play there. And I 
think one of the things we need to think about is how to infuse more transparency into the process. And but what I mean by that specifically is, are there ways that we can make it very easy for people to tell how content, if content has been adjusted and how it's been adjusted? Um, so that at least if they're looking at something, they can tell whether or not they're looking at an image that's been manipulated. There are perfectly valid and legitimate reasons why images are manipulated. But if as a consumer, as a person, you understand that deep fakes are an issue, and then you can easily tell when you're looking at something how it was manipulated, what part of the content was changed, I think that will really help. Um, it will be part of helping to try to make sure that people are not being taken in in ways that are more nefarious by deep fakes. So I think it's I think it's a really important issue. I think it's something that Poppy said that we're going to see an enormous increase in and uh, and we need to be trying to get our hands around it now. Um, and and would, would love to talk more about that um, in terms of, of you know. Uh, so this is a particularly novel, but uh, I'll just say, you know, I think remote work is here to stay. Um, I say that as someone who um, for this was an enormous adjustment for me personally and for our organization because uh, I'm such a big believer in in-person. You know, I think people still want to work together, but I think even when this is over, I think businesses are, are going to find ways to have much more flexibility in how people work um, and the ability to work remotely. And an opportunity there, which I think is really exciting, both for business strategy, but also for a broader economic opportunity for people, is the ability for, for CEOs to look for the best talent, regardless of location. I think there's an enormous opportunity there for them to spread out job opportunity um, across the United States and across the world. But I think that, uh, I think remote work and then the positive economic benefits that can come from that um, are my big business prediction that will remain post COVID. Do you think that there are any, you know, any risks from that as well? I mean, of course, if if remote work can enable, you know, more so-called offshoring, right? I mean, you don't you don't have to, you're, you mean, you're completely unconstrained by geography. Don't you think there could be a bit of a backlash against that? And also, I think some economists from Deutsche Bank have just suggested that remote workers should pay an extra 5% in tax just because they're sort of, it's a kind of privilege to be able, for a knowledge worker to be able to do your job at home. And how does it affect all of those workers, frontline workers who can't? So I'm glad you phrased that as knowledge worker, because I do think people think of this as a tech, like you are your software engineer, your tech job. And that's not actually what I mean. There are you know, jobs in every industry sector are enabled by software. And now because of software, as we've been talking about, because the software tools allow people to work remotely, we could have people working in a vast uh, array of jobs across industry sectors, not just tech jobs, not just software engineers working remotely. I don't think it doesn't, you know, there are, there are other constraints on, on and other reasons why CEOs make decisions about where they hire that are not just about geography and remote work. So, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think by any means we're going to turn into an all remote work economy, but I do think it means that there, we have the opportunity to have job opportunities in places in the United States where we need to have more of them in other places in the world where we need to have more of them. And so I, you know, I think done kind of intentionally and carefully, and there's a lot that needs to happen in order to make that really viable, um, you know, including increasing high speed internet access, increasing education and worker training programs. There's a lot that governments in the private sector would need to do together to make that real. But I think if it's done intentionally, I think there, I think there's some business strategy opportunities in terms of increasing the diversity of the workforce and finding the best talent wherever it is. But I think there's really enormous uh, generationally impactful changes in terms of economic opportunity and bringing jobs to where people are. Absolutely. Nicolas, on, on the digital transformation theme um, that, that you have in your book, um, I mean, presumably you, you also believe and the, the, the companies you work with believe that a lot of the, the, the kind of behavior that has established itself during the past 12 months is going to endure. I mean, sometimes you get a lot of excitement around change and journalists write a lot about it. And then, you know, things kind of get back to normal after that. Um, very, very interested to know what your what, what your instinct on that is. <laughs> Well, I think, uh, as you said, the digital transformation we have been seeing, uh, I 
is it has been accelerated in the last 12 months or eight months and is is here to stay and i think let me just give you three examples which i found particularly interesting one is uh, uh victoria just spoke about remote work or new ways of working uh well we have uh, large uh, industrial conglomerates uh, in germany for example siemens which announced that uh, uh, they would go on a, a two days week at home uh, home office and three days in the office um i think this is something which other companies are following and i think that will have an impact um, on, on many parts of, 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 of our society, be it mobility, be it infrastructure, be it real estate and so on. So I think that's one, what, one element we see. The second element I think which I see is that a lot of the go-to-market uh, is uh, also becoming more and more digital. Yeah? Uh, I think it's quite interesting that at the height of the uh, COVID pandemic, Tesla launched the contact-free uh, car delivery. Yeah, so while traditional car OEMs were saying, well, handing over a car is a specific ceremony and it's the kind of most important a moment you have as a car owner, well, uh, there is another player who said, let's do that without any sales representative. Let's do that completely contact-free. So I think that's also something uh, that, 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 that will happen. And last but not least, again, I'm coming back to this topic of, of, of resilience. I think... Uh, uh, the pandemic has shown that the companies that have a strong digital end-to-end -end understanding of the processes are more resilient than those who don't. Yeah, and I'm coming back to my steering wheel examples from Wuhan. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's where I see the digital transformation. So I see digital transformation both in the way how employees will work and continue to work, the way how goods will be sold, and the way how you will operate your factories and your supply chain. Great, thank you. So I'd like to talk about the subject of um, of purpose, corporate purpose, and, and of course mm -hmm. in um, in uh, summer of last year, the US Business Roundtable of, of CEOs made that very significant change, you know, raising um, stakeholders up the list, far up the list of priorities versus shareholders. Um, Poppy, I'd love to get your perspective on um, you first of all, how important is is purpose for a CEO now? I mean, I gather that I, I mean one headhunter told me that it's not enough just to kind of do well for, you know, in term, in financial terms. You have to be a sort of statesman um, these days if you're if you're wanting to get the very top jobs at some of the biggest companies. So, how important do you think um, purpose is, and how real is it? I mean. Is it is it a very a sort of ultra sophisticated marketing strategy, or is there something really crunchy there, where a CEO is having to make a choice perhaps between you know do I do this in the usual old way, thinking about my shareholders, or maybe do I sacrifice um, a little bit of profit in order to take stakeholders more fully into account? I think purpose is is everything. It's your north star in navigating what is often a sort of chaotic and busy time of a CEO that's leading businesses, especially ones that are growing quickly or through big transformation. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of noise. And that sense of purpose is your single point of reference that everything hangs off on. Is this helping me achieve my single purpose? And so it is absolutely, I know from my own experience, that is absolutely the point of which all of your prioritization occurs across. And making sure that your your board, your your shareholders are aligned with that sense of purpose means that it shouldn't necessarily be a choice between one or the other. You should be that should be something that you're all united behind. And that's something that I've personally experienced is knowing that my board are supporting me in the achievement of that singular purpose. And that is something that for now and for the time being, I certainly feel that my stakeholders and my shareholders are very much aligned in. But yes, when it comes to a sort of a, a difference between the two, maybe you're feeling a pull where your stakeholders and shareholders are moving in a different direction. That is something I think where where your purpose or something may need to be revisited. But without that sense of purpose, it's going to be very difficult for any CEO to prioritise anything that they're trying to achieve in the short term or in the long term. 
I think that's really interesting. I mean, I've, I've um, done quite a lot of work on corporate purpose, and it, this is the first time I've heard of it as a sort of pragmatic, you kind of, you know, almost a, something with huge utility, just in terms of, you know, cutting through the noise and all of these various kind of threats that we're that we're getting in 2020 and for the past few years. I think that's really interesting. Um, Nikolaus, I note that. Um, you're, that you are maybe not sort of at the extreme end of purpose evangelism. I think you're more on the sort of, you know, the long term greedy, as we put it internally at The Economist, that, you know, that it's you know, being short term greedy is actually bad for shareholders. What you need to be is long term greedy involving stakeholders. So in your um, strategies um, in going beyond great, you recommend integrating doing good into the core strategy, which I think is very mm -hmm. wise rather than having it sort of separate. Could you talk about kind of where you are on the spectrum of, you know, kind of extreme stakeholderism versus kind of total obsession with short term shareholder value? Yeah, well, I think, and we have uh, clearly positioned that, I think, in the, our book, Beyond Great, in describing uh, companies that we believe have to go from great to beyond great by moving from a short-term, I would say, total shareholder return perspective to a long-term stakeholder perspective. And that stakeholder uh, perspective uh, encompasses really, I would say, the society at large. Uh, and uh, we personally think that this is one of the fundamental changes between the 1990s and the 2020s. Um, it is the fact that uh, you will not, uh, as a company, be evaluated only uh, on your balance sheet and on your P&L, but you will really be looked at your impact have on society and on local communities. Now, as we discussed, I think this is not something that every company has fully embraced. And it's also something that will have very different uh, formats and, and approaches. But I personally think that there are companies out there that can really act as a benchmark. And, and if you allow me just a, a brief example, um, we have also showcased it in the in the in the book. Uh, Brazilian cosmetics company Natura. Uh, who uh, has started in Brazil uh, some 30, 40 years ago, uh, owns today also world-known brands such as The Body Shop or Avon or Aesop, uh, they have been very clear on the fact of saying we want to be a um, company that has a very careful approach of natural resources and that also have a lasting effect on local communities. So their sales distribution network, for example, are not shops, but it's 1.8 million Brazilian uh, ladies that have went through a training program and that are using uh, this approach and this, this, this occupation to kind of uh, have a, also professional activity. So it's just an example, and they are also carbon neutral since 2007. They were very early in using reusable packaging in the 1980s. But I think these type of companies should become more prevalent, and that's what also company. That's also what we as BCG think is the way to go. Great, thank you. Um, lastly, um, I'd like to talk about. You know, amid the the doom and the gloom and and some of the worry, and and of course we've we've um, framed this in terms of you know what keeps CEOs awake at night, but I think perhaps we don't pay enough attention to what the opportunities are, and if we could set aside um, social impact and the you know economic nationalism problems. I'd like to eat, ask each of you what the opportunities of this period are, because I think they sort of get drowned out amid um, the amid sort of coverage of, of industries um, such as you know entertainment, hospitality, and so on that are being terribly hit by what's going on. Could could each of you give me sort of what you think are the top two or three sort of profit making competitive? sort of innovation opportunities of, of the current period and moving into next year. 
Um, and I'll start with with you, um, Poppy. Yeah, just I think one immediate front and foremost of my mind is artificial intelligence. Um, we've talked a lot about digital transformation and the volumes of data that now surround our, the digital fo finger, footprint of our businesses. And it's just too much information for humans to be able to understand and query themselves. And artificial intelligence is such an opportunity to augment the talent of those people within the business and allow them to become so much more productive and to upskill them and to achieve things that humans alone wouldn't necessarily be able to achieve. And I think artificial intelligence provides a huge, huge opportunity for us as individuals and businesses to be far better at what we've ever been able to achieve before and address what is going to be a growing skills shortage. Wasn't that already the case in, in 2019, however? What, 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 you know, the, the promise was well, already. I mean, every company tries to describe itself as a, an AI company, right? And it was certainly in, in, the, in, the, in the tech startup world. I had a, um, I saw an advert for a toothbrush that's powered by artificial intelligence the other day, and I thought the same thing. <laughs> Obviously, leading an artificial intelligence organization where we are deploying AI at scale within an enterprise without a human being there to assist it. And I understand exactly how difficult it is to achieve that. I have to say, I frown a little at some of the AI that is used in sort of terms of marketing. But we are today using artificial intelligence to solve real real life problems for real life businesses and we are able to do it in real time and that was something that wasn't possible five ten years ago and this is enabling if you think about the speed at which this digital transformation has occurred we're just not able to invest in our schools and our our teenagers at the pace that is required because it's still going to take them a number of years to pop out the education system. So we just can't keep up with that. But by being able to augment the people that are already in the system with AI, we're already seeing today that they're becoming so much more capable and productive. And that is something that I think will only accelerate in the sort of future years. And personally, it's something that I think is, I find really exciting and necessary okay. given all the digital transformation that's occurring. So artificial intelligence, the, the key opportunity um, of the current time. Let's focus on I that. Would, yes. Victoria, what would you what would you add? Uh, so I agree with everything Poppy said. I, I would let me I'm gonna take it in a slightly different direction. I think you know one of the opportunities and frankly one of the imperatives we have now is to rebuild a more resilient economy. I think there's a lot of business opportunity in that. I think there's also a big part of that is both job creation, but as I was saying before, to bring jobs where people are, so that a person in Kansas has the same job opportunities that a person in San Francisco has. And I think building on that, or in order to make that possible, we have to make sure that this digital transformation that we've all been talking about, this global digital economy, works for everyone and that everyone has access to it. So that is, you know, that is high-speed internet access, uh, that is a government and business sector investment together that is opportunities for education and worker skills and i think those are again things where business and governments need to be working together because neither one can do it well in my opinion by themselves but i think there's an enormous opportunity and i think the acceleration the digital transformation acceleration of COVID, and as we were discussing the resiliency that we've seen in our own teams and in people around the world, I think there is real opportunity there um, to try to take the digital economy and make it more accessible for everyone. Yes, I mean, certainly your your members have, you know, have participated in this opportunity to an extraordinary degree, hence some of the most amazing stock market valuations of, of, of enterprise software firms and, and the whole sector. So I think that's that's very clear to see. Um, Nicolaus, um, what would you say are the, the the sort of the real competitive profit making opportunities, not to sort of transform society um, or to heal geopolitical rifts, but for, for individual CEOs and businesses, how should they be looking to capitalize on the current environment? Well, before I answer that, I think I just wanted to add two things which I think are real opportunities because they're also close to my heart with regard to, to what has COVID changed and what can we learn from it. One is I think the whole area around health and well-being. 
while I think uh, uh, in North America and Western Europe, we are used to go to the gym or we are used to use, a lot, there's a lot of trend of towards organic food and things like this. Uh, we have mm -hmm. been looking at more than 50 markets in the world and we've seen that actually health and well-being has been one of the biggest opportunities in this COVID and post-COVID world across across regions and across geography. That's number one. Number two, I think what is also very important is I think I hope that if there's something positive of homeschooling, which I think was really challenging for us, we have three small kids, uh, but if there's something positive coming from homeschooling is the, is the digitalization of education and I hope that as my kids are back to school, we have learned to use some of these digital tools of learning to bring in not only one teacher, but several teachers in front of the children to bring in experts and to have a much more diversified way of teaching and of learning, which I think is also a big, big opportunity going forward. Yeah. So uh, these are just two examples of, of, of uh, that. Going forward, you said, well, what is what the CEOs need to address? I think this post the COVID world. I think it, it's again about uh, embracing, I think, all the new digital opportunities that we are seeing uh, arising. It's about building resilience in the operations and in the supply chains. Uh, and it's, I think, also really uh, uh, kind of thanking uh, their employees uh, who I think have been really extremely agile and engaged uh, to, to cope with that crisis. Great, thank you. Um, I think that we have run out of time there, um, but I'm glad to have ended on a on a um, an upbeat note, um, as well as to add some positive elements to the CEO's playbook. Um, I have to say that it seems like a a, a job um, that only uh, an immortal um, and unbelievably talented human could do these days. Um, so I think. The contributions that we've had um, and the ideas from this session will, will certainly be helpful in putting into that playbook. Thank you so much, um, each of you, for joining.